Okay, I only have one item for you all at the top, uh, a brief preview of the president's schedule for next week. Uh, on Monday, he will visit FEMA headquarters in D.C. to receive a briefing on the Atlantic hurricane outlook and preparedness efforts. On Tuesday, he will mark the anniversary of the death of George Floyd. Uh, we'll have more details on what the plans are for that day uh, soon, uh, maybe later today, maybe, maybe later this weekend. On Thursday, the President will travel to Cleveland, Ohio to deliver remarks on the economy. And on Friday, his budget will be released and he will also travel to Wilmington where he will remain over the Memorial Day weekend. With that, Darlene, why don't you kick us off? Thank you. I uh, wanted to start with Israel. Um, <clears throat> does the, um, the President or the White House have any concerns that the extent to which the Israeli Prime Minister continues the war will affect the President's own ability to continue to defend Israel's right to defend itself? I know that's a little circular, but... You mean domestically here, yes. or...? Yes. Well, first I would say that um, the President's uh, set a clear objective from the beginning, which was to end the war, play any role we can ending the war, and bring it to a conclusion as quickly as possible. And at the beginning, that seemed highly unlikely, given there were thousands of rockets falling on Tel Aviv and the Israelis were on a war footing and preparing for, by many reports, a ground invasion. So I would say what's important to look at and reflect on here is historic precedent and the fact that the conflict in 2014, many more lives were lost. Also, it went on for 51 days. So uh, the President's view is that, and his view from the beginning, was that through disciplined, intensive, and quiet, and a disciplined, intensive, and quiet campaign of diplomacy, uh, and one where we would lead coordination in the region, we could bring an end to the conflict more quickly than it was intended to be. And it's also important to remember that Hamas is a terrorist organization, that uh, Israel, of course, continues to have the right to defend itself. But what's most important from now uh, forward, in his view, is uh, to, to um, contemplate uh, where we go from here, uh, Darlene. And certainly he talked yesterday about uh, replenishing support for the Iron Dome. And our view is that saved hundreds of lives, maybe more than that, uh, given the effectiveness, also to support through the United Nations uh, continued additional assistance in rebuilding Gaza. We've already, of course, uh, restarted our assistance that was ended in 2018 through UNRWA, uh, through the United States, but we'll work through the through the UN. And we also will remain engaged deeply uh, with diplomatic conversations with leaders in the region. So, uh, you know, obviously anyone uh, here domestically will have to make uh, their own decisions, but I would say that, um, you know, it's important to convey what our intention was, uh, what we feel, uh, that we feel this was concluded uh, as a result of the President's uh, engagement and, um, and uh, frankly, discipline from the beginning uh, much faster than uh, these conflicts have been in the past. Go ahead. But oh, go ahead, darling. Go ahead. We, we also heard this week a lot of Democrats shifting their tone on Israel. So is, is it time for the President or the White House or the United States to also perhaps start thinking about shifting the approach, its approach shifting, to Israel? What are, what, shifting in what way? You had a lot of Democrats who were frustrated that uh, the President didn't call for a ceasefire immediately. That was one thing they, a lot of people were upset about. So, and, and the sort of, I don't want to say knee-jerk, but the U.S. position is that Israel has a right to defend itself. And there are a lot of Democrats who, I think, from what we heard them say this week, they don't necessarily buy into that. And so the thinking is, is there some shift in the approach to Israel? Well, um, Darlene, I think the reason I answered it the way I did is because obviously we all shared an objective of bringing an end to the conflict. The President's view and his strategic approach and that of his team was that the best way to do that was not to call out our allies and partners, but was to remain closely coordinated and to work in lockstep and at the right moment uh, to convey it was time to wind it down. And uh, that's exactly what he did. And now the conflict is concluded in 11 days. And uh, frankly, he resisted calls to take an alternative approach that, in his view, would have had an alternative outcome. Uh, so uh, that's why I answered it the way I did. Go ahead. Oh, one. I have one final question. Sure. Uh, yesterday, we had a ceremony here. The bill signing, a large group of lawmakers yeah. came. We had the Medal of Honor ceremony yes. today. We're uh, back. 
the meeting with the Kennedy Center honors that we were told yeah. President First Lady had, I've seen handshakes, hugging, kissing. Yes. Is the White House open again? Can you talk about some of the considerations that went into um, these events over the past couple of days? And is this the norm, the new norm, the yes. new, new norm going forward? I can confirm we are a warm and fuzzy crew, and we like to hug around here. Um, but we were waiting for that to be allowed by uh, CDC guidelines, which we certainly abide by. So uh, we are, as many organizations and companies are, working to implement uh, these guidelines here at the White House. And so what you've seen over the last couple of days is efforts to do uh, exactly that. And that includes uh, welcoming back and having a full uh, briefing room very soon. Uh, it includes uh, having more events with more people uh, and certainly uh, continuing to open the White House up, uh, the People's House up to the American public. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, back to Israel for a moment. Uh, one of the other examples I think that would fit into Darlene's question is this pressure from lawmakers over the $735 million pending sale of precision-guided missiles to Israel. I know the president said yesterday he's committed to replenishing the Iron Dome, but is he also committed to making sure that sale goes through? We have no plans to change our uh, security assistance uh, that we're providing to Israel. But I will say that the president's view is through is that we need to do we need to move forward on a couple of fronts. Certainly, supporting uh, the security of Israel is one of them. Uh, but another front is rebuilding, playing a constructive role in rebuilding Gaza, providing assistance and funding through the UN efforts to do exactly that, ensuring that it is not Hamas, but is the the Palestinian people who benefit from that assistance. And doing that through the UN is, in our view, the best way to do that. It also includes uh, continuing to have an engaged diplomacy with leaders in the region, uh, continuing discussions with officials r uh, across the Middle East, Egyptians, Israelis, Palestinian leaders, Qataris, others, about how we move forward from here. And then on, on police reform, uh, it looks like this sort of soft Memorial Day deadline is going to slip without uh, legislation being passed. Is the White House losing some confidence in the bipartisan talks that are going on on Capitol Hill? And also, how does President Biden plan to address that issue on Tuesday when he speaks about the anniversary of George Floyd's death? Well, I would say first that the president used the uh, occasion of his joint address, one of the highest profile moments any president has, to speak about, reiterate his view that it police reform is long overdue, that the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is exactly the right uh, forum and uh, bill that could help uh, get that done, rebuild trust in communities. Uh, what we've seen from the negotiators, and we've been in close touch with the negotiators as well, is that they still feel there is progress being made. Yes, it's unlikely, uh, as they've conveyed as well, we're going to meet the timeline that the, that the president outlined in his speech. Uh, which he did because he felt that it was important to lift it up, to be goal bold and ambitious in how we're talking about such an important piece of legislation. But we have confidence in the negotiators, and we've seen them convey publicly that they feel the vibes are good and they're continuing to make progress. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, is the president confident that this ceasefire will hold? And if so, can you explain a bit why? Did he receive any kinds of assurances from Prime Minister Netanyahu? Well, we have strong assurances, assurances, sorry, I don't know why that was a hard word. Let me try again. We have strong assurances from the relevant parties uh, that they are committed to the ceasefire. And obviously, this is something we will be watching extremely closely in the coming days. And I think uh, what's important to note is in the final 24 hours leading up to the ceasefire, uh, obviously, the president was deeply engaged before that. But he was very, it was especially deeply engaged in that period of time, as were high-level senior officials here. And they were uh, back and forth on the phone between many different parties, the Israelis, the Egyptians who were in touch with Hamas, and others, uh, about the importance of not violating, even pre-violating the ceasefire in the hours leading up to it, as we see uh, did not happen. So we will be in cl close touch with all parties. We clearly will be watching it, but we do have assurances from the relevant parties that they are committed. And yesterday before this was announced, you said you expected Israel to start winding down their operations because they had achieved significant military objectives. So how much of the timing of this do you think is because of the president's diplomatic approach and how much of this is simply because the Israelis had exhausted much of their targets in Gaza? Well, I think what's, again, important to remember is to point back to how these conflicts have worked in the past. Uh, and we have seen these conflicts last for weeks and weeks, 
many, many more lives lost. Now, we certainly know there were lives lost in this 11-day conflict. Everyone is a tragedy. Uh, but certainly, um, because of the President's deep engagement, his long relationships, uh, the fact that he set a clear objective from the beginning that we were going to uh, put out the noise and focus on our strategy of deep, intensive, quiet diplomacy, have conversations, uh, not call out our partners and allies and do that do it do our engagements through uh, through one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, we certainly think uh, that had an impact uh, now of course we also were watching closely uh, where and and we're in touch with them closely about uh, about their uh, military successes and certainly that was a part a factor but a part of the discussion as well and sort of a scheduling question here there had been an expectation that there was going to be a conversation of some kind today between Republicans on the Hill, some officials here at the White House mm -hmm. about the status of infrastructure and the Republican counter proposal. Is that meeting still happening today? And can you give us kind of an update on where things stand uh, and any movement that, that may or may not be happening? Sure, um, it is happening. It may be ongoing as we speak, but it started shortly before uh, 1 o'clock over video conference this afternoon. Uh, our team, including Steve Reschetti, Louisa Terrell, Brian Deese, Secretary Raimondo, and Secretary Buttigieg, put forward a reasonable counter offer uh, that reduces the size of the package from $2.25 trillion in additional investment to 1.7 trillion. And in our view, this is the act, uh, the art, I should say, of seeking common ground. This proposal exhibits a willingness to come down in size, giving on some areas uh, that are important to the president, otherwise they wouldn't have been in the proposal, while also staying firm in areas that are most vital to rebuilding our infrastructure and industries of the future, making our workforce and our country more competitive with China. We actually have every intention to share the complete uh, totality of the counterproposal with you all. We'll just wait for the meeting to conclude to do that. Until then, can you say any more about what was taken out to, to lower that, that price tag? Sure. Let me give you kind of some top line details. And then again, what the counterproposal that we'll put out is very detailed, so you'll see all the specifics for yourself. But uh, again, I noted the top line number that was offered. Uh, it, our proposal also involved uh, a shifting, uh, in shifting investments in research and development, supply chains, manufacturing, and small business out of the negotiation into other efforts, such as the Endless Frontiers Act and the CHIPS Act, which, as you know, there's ongoing discussions and negotiations on a bipartisan level about those as well. Uh, the, president, the proposal also agreed to reduce the funding request for broadband to match the Republican offer and to reduce the proposed investment in roads, bridges, and major projects to come closer to the number proposed by the senators. This is all in the spirit of finding common ground. Now, at the same time, as I alluded to, we also, the counter offer also reflects our view that the Republican offer excludes entirely some proposals that are key to our competitiveness, uh, key to investments in clean energy and in, in industries of the future and rebuilding our workforce, including critical investments in our power sector, building and construction, workforce training, veterans hospital construction, and the care economy. So we push for increased funding levels for critical transportation infrastructure like rail, especially considering China's level of investment in such projects, as well as the elimination of lead pipes that poison drinking water and resilience projects as extreme weather events, as we've seen around the country, continue to become more common as a result of climate change. And lastly, any changes to how you would like to pay for all of this? Uh, we also reiterated, or the intention is to reiterate, um, uh, the fact that the President is not willing to raise taxes on Americans earning under $400,000 a year through a gas tax or through user fees. He believes that the extraordinarily wealthy, uh, that companies uh, that many of whom have not paid taxes uh, in recent years, uh, can uh, afford a modest increase to pay for middle class jobs. Uh, do you have another question? Very good. Okay, go ahead. Just heard you describe the infrastructure negotiations as the art of seeking common ground. At some point, does that become the art of the deal? I don't know. I, you're the professional here, Peter. You're the TV star, you know? Um, What's the Fox Chiron going to be? Uh, art of seeking common ground does take a, a lot of characters. Uh, it does. So it does. Control the art of the, of the deal. We'd be okay with that. Yeah. With the art of the deal, I think that's a headline. Well, there you go. An art of, the, of a different kind of deal. A deal for the working people. Got it. Okay, um, go ahead. So on, Glad we could work that out. Thank you very much. Uh, on Israel, how much credit does President Biden think he deserves for the ceasefire that was negotiated by the president of Egypt? 
Well, first of all, the President's uh, focus was on one objective, which was bringing an end to the conflict as quickly as possible. As you know, and as, as, as our briefing day in and day out was evidence of, there was criticism, and as Darlene's question was evidence of, there was criticism coming from many sides. We kept our head down, focused on our strategic objective, focused on intensive, quiet diplomacy to uh, bring an end to the conflict as quickly as possible. Uh, our engagements with the leaders of Egypt, uh, what were, was a, the leader of Egypt was a key part of that discussion uh, and a key part of uh, bringing an end to the conflict, given their important relationships with Hamas. And I know, because we are just trying to understand all these, uh, the dozens of calls and who played what role. Mm -hmm. The president extended his sincere gratitude to President al-Sisi and the other senior Egyptian officials who played a critical role in the diplomacy. So if their role was critical, how does the White House describe President Biden's role? Well, again, Peter, I think what I can do here, what, what the president was conveying is that this was an effort, much of it coordinated by the United States, much of which he was involved in personally, uh, engagements on the phone, engagements with his team, uh, a, a commitment and a driving desire to keep the strategy aligned with what we knew uh, would help uh, bring an end to the conflict as quickly as possible. He's also someone who wants to give credit where credit is due, and that includes the role the Egyptians played and the role many countries in the region played in, uh, in working to bring an end to the conflict. And then quickly, and also his team. I mean, he called out Secretary of State Tony Blinken. He called out his National Security Advisor, and also our UN Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, who played an important role here as well. Uh, quickly on immigration, the governor of Tennessee says that he was asked and he declined a Biden administration request to house unaccompanied minors. And in coming days or, or in recent days, there have been some reports that at least four planes filled with unaccompanied minors landed in his state, some in the middle of the night. Uh, can you explain what's going on there? Well, as we have been very clear about, children, uh, our objective is to unite these unaccompanied children, children under the age of 18, with families, with sponsor families, so children traveling through, were traveling through, have been traveling through Tennessee. Uh, they are simply on their way to unite with relatives and sponsors to meet sponsors in the state or just traveling through Tennessee until they reach another destination to unite with family members or legal sponsors. As you know, geographically, it's <coughs> right in a place where, it, you know, there's a lot of states around it, so it's a place where some flights have gone through as uh, children are moving to other destinations. And since this was uh, something that the governor of the state said he didn't want, this is not a case of federal officials trying to sneak something past the state level officials. Uh, I think I'm confirming here that Tennessee is a state that is right near in the middle of the country, and some kids have to travel through, through there to get through their destination. And we've been very clear that our objective is to treat these kids humanely, get them to safe homes, especially homes of loved ones and sponsored families. Go ahead. Uh, point of clarification. You mentioned uh, detailed some of the cuts to the yeah. counter proposal. Did I hear you right? They said they're going to find a home in other Senate legislation that's currently through now, like the China bill. So while they're coming out of your counter proposal, they are going to find a home somewhere. There else. are some components, yeah, where there is um, some overlap in the Frontiers Bill and the Chips Bill, uh, where there is opportunity to still move forward on some of the president's ideas. Gotcha. Um, uh, Republican governors in uh, some 22 states have rolled back those uh, expanded unemployment benefits. What is the White House or the Biden administration doing to 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 preserve those benefits, if anything, um, at the state level? Well, Jared. Uh, it is up to, of course, these governors to make a decision about what assistance they want to provide to the people of their states. Uh, our view continues to be that uh, unemployment insurance, of course, at a federal level, which is something we advocate for and would work to pass through Congress or have worked to pass through Congress, is something that can help people during a time where there are still more than 8 million people out of work make ends meet. Uh, and that uh, there is not overwhelming data that suggests that uh, it is a driving factor in people not uh, re-entering the workforce, especially at a time where we're continuing to recover from the pandemic. But it is ultimately up to governors to make those decisions. And there's nothing the federal government can do, just to be clear. We can continue to convey what we see in the data, what we advocate for in terms of what we think will help get people back on their feet, uh, and we use every opportunity sure. to do that. Um, the Washington Post just reported uh, some details on the upcoming budget, specifically that the, um, the, the, the public option to create a government-run health insurance program and a pledge to cut prescription drug costs are not going to be in that budget proposal. Anything you can comment on that? 
Well, we'll be uh, announcing and rolling out the president's proposed budget uh, a week from today. Buckle up. I know it's a big day for Reuters those days. Um, and I'm not going to get too far ahead of that. But what I will tell you is that what it will outline uh, is how we're proposing uh, to pay for um, a range of the proposals the president has put forward. And he's clearly talked about and remains committed to uh, his uh, campaign pledge of pushing for a public option, to doing something to address uh, the rising co cost of prescription drugs, something he talked about uh, in his joint session address. Uh, but every entity may not be reflected in this budget. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, back to the Middle East. Prime Minister Netanyahu seemed to ignore President Biden's requests for a de-escalation of the violence over several days. And then a truce was struck once Egypt stepped in. So I guess the question is, why should people have confidence that President Biden will be able to work with him for a de-escalation should there be another flare-up? Through with Prime Minister Netanyahu? I would just have to say, Kristen, that I don't think that's how any of the parties involved, the Prime Minister, uh, the Egyptian president, or this president would characterize what happened over the last 11 days. And obviously some of this is going to remain um, continue to be remain uh, behind the door, behind the scenes through what what uh, what was quiet diplomacy over the course of 11 days. But uh, there's no question that uh, the president's engagement, uh, both with the Israeli prime minister, both with uh, the with the president of Egypt, uh, with leaders in the region, uh, our commitment to staying disciplined and remaining focused on our overarching objective of bringing an end to the conflict as quickly as possible um, was uh, contributed to, uh, to the ceasefire we saw last night. Well, I guess what I'm asking about is based on your own readouts from the White House, President Biden uh, pressed Prime Minister Netanyahu to de-escalate the violence and then in later phone calls uh, urged a ceasefire and that didn't happen until And there was a ceasefire of... last night and he urged for a ceasefire about two days in advance of that. And again, I would say that the president's objective from the beginning was to have these conversations quietly, to work in close coordination with the prime minister about how we could bring an end to the conflict, recognizing fully that at the same time there were thousands of rockets coming into cities in Israel from Hamas. And uh, that was something the prime minister uh, was going to work to defend. And the president said yesterday that he told Prime Minister Netanyahu he would replenish the Iron Dome yeah. system. Did he offer that as a promise in order to reach the ceasefire? And were there any concessions made as a part of this deal? First of all, the president did that because, uh, conveyed that because he felt that the effectiveness of the Iron Dome helped save hundreds of lives. And uh, it remains, the president remains um, uh, steadfast, of course, in his support of Israel's right to defend itself, uh, but also believes that um, the effectiveness of the Iron Dome is something that we should continue to support and we will continue to support as the United States. Any concessions made in by order the to United States? This deal by the United States in order no. to? No. Okay. Um, let me ask you domestically. At, you just said it's unlikely they will reach a deal on the George Floyd Policing Act by next Tuesday. Well, the negotiators have conveyed that. Correct, yes, they have conveyed that. What will the pressure point be if not this one year anniversary? How does President Biden make sure this gets done? And if you speak to civil rights groups, interest groups, they want it done this summer. Well, first of all, with the, all of the negotiators are continuing to press forward on working to find common grand, ground to get this done. The president wants to sign it into law. And of course, the anniversary of George Floyd's death, something that impacted the president personally and deeply as it impacted millions of Americans, was a moment to call for action, to call for forward movement. But the negotiators, by all accounts, are continuing to make progress. They're continuing to have good discussions. And uh, that is a positive sign. Uh, so, you know, we are not going to uh, slow, our, slow our efforts to get this done, but we can also be transparent about the fact that it's going to take a little bit more time. That sometimes that happens and that's okay. By the summer, does the president want this done by the summer? The president wants to sign it into law as quickly as possible. To follow up on something that Mary was asking you, this counter proposal, yeah. can you tell us specifically about the corporate tax rate? 
Has there been any change to the corporate tax rate? Has it come down to 25 percent, something that Democrats were asking for? Well, again, our, our counter proposal is primarily focused on the areas of investment, as you'll see when we provide the specific details. And what I reiterated to, which is the president's bottom line about not raising taxes on people making less than $400,000 a year, encouraging uh, uh, the uh, Republican uh, ranking members and leaders to take a fresh look at uh, the fact that many corporations can afford to pay a little bit more taxes and so can many on the highest income. That was really what was in our counter proposal in terms of what was discussed in the meeting. I don't have a readout so of that no quite yet. yet to the corporate tax rate that you're aware of. Well, I mean, the proposal of the corporate. I'm not a mathematician, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But obviously, we proposed a package that was 500 billion dollars less expensive, so it needs less pay fors. Uh, but what that looks like uh, will have to be a part of the negotiation. Okay. Um, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jenna. I'm hoping you can give us an update on um, international inbound travel. I'm wondering if the administration. I wish I could. <laughs> it's a very popular question. I was going to ask if the administration feels any urgency uh, ahead of the summer high season mm -hmm. uh, to make any new policy moves. Well, we certainly uh, understand uh, the desire of uh, many Europeans to come travel to the United States uh, and vice versa. And. Um, and uh, people, that's part of returning to normal and part of uh, what will make people feel good about the efforts to fight the pandemic. But uh, we can't respond to public pressure or even emotion. We have to rely on the health and guidance, uh, the guidance of our health and medical experts, which is exactly what we'll do. But in terms of that guidance at this point, that the CDC is saying for vaccinated individuals, they can go in and outside, uh, large crowds, small crowds, uh, you know, they say that vaccinated individuals can travel yeah, internationally. And, and they're still required to wear masks, and airline travel's a little different. And again, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, uh, but we rely on their advice. And they obviously are continuing to consider and update uh, guidance as information becomes available. And in terms of um, possibly requiring uh, you know, proof of vaccination mm -hmm. for non-US citizens, is there any uh, further consideration of that that you could share? A vaccine passport? I didn't use that term. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you mean the same basic thing, the federal government requiring vaccines, uh, yes, vac so proof, of vaccination. proof of vaccination. That is not in our intended plan. Just on a, on a different topic, on um, Colonel uh, Puckett Jr. Yeah. Why was, maybe you could take us a little bit into sure. the decision to have him be the first recipient of a, of a Medal of Honor uh, from the President? Well, clearly he has an incredible personal story and is part of what the president feels is one of the greatest generations uh, in history. And uh, he also has um, a, a great deal of support uh, for the sacrifices he made and the incredible story we just heard the president tell at that event. Um, you know, it's, and the president, I think, felt it was important to honor him, recognize him, um, you know, uh, 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 as one of the first people. Um, uh, given the service that he paid to the country and, uh, you know, the fact that he is uh, still a young man, uh, but uh, someone we want to recognize while his family can celebrate with him. Go ahead, Ann. Uh, let me try a different version of Kristen's question on Israel. Okay. So on Wednesday, the, the readout of the president's call with the prime minister was pretty blunt uh, in saying that the, the president had told the prime minister he expected to see a significant de-escalation that day, mm -hmm. Wednesday. The ceasefire didn't come until more, well more than 24 hours later, uh, two, well, 36 hours later, 2 a.m. Friday local time. Uh, was the president concerned and was there, uh, at a, was there any consternation around here as the day wore on on Wednesday and moved into Thursday uh, that the prime minister was blowing him off, uh, not listening to him, not doing what the president had asked him to do? No, and that is not a reflection of what happened behind the scenes either. Clearly the president felt it was important to convey, uh, I even in a public readout, that uh, his view and the view of the United States was it was time to move toward a ceasefire. Uh, and just over 24 hours later, 
there was an agreed ceasefire. And that required additional conversations behind the scenes, many of which the president was involved in himself, as you well know, uh, because we did readouts of them. It required also an agreement, as you know, Anne, from the other side, uh, and required an agreement uh, from Hamas uh, that they also would uh, engage in the ceasefire, hence the conversation the president had uh, with uh, uh, President el-Sisi uh, on Thursday, just yesterday morning, that was uh, an, a factor that led to that agreement on that side. So uh, it was the moment in the discussions and negotiations where the president felt it was important to convey that publicly. Obviously, he uh, was careful about what he uh, conveyed publicly, what he said publicly, what we said in readouts publicly, but uh, it was a reflection of that. But over the, the last 24 to 36 hours, we're clearly pivotal in bringing an end to the conflict. But it's unusual for a president to throw a flag like that and to say to a foreign leader that effectively the U.S. president is setting a deadline for, for specific action. If that specific action <coughs> isn't met in the deadline the president sets, even though I completely take your point that there was a ton of other stuff happening and it wasn't a terribly long, mm -hmm. long much longer time period than the one the president has set, is there a risk that the president looks uh, in, in any way uh, weak or ineffective in having set the deadline to begin with? Well, first of all, there was a ceasefire in 11 days. That was uh, one-fifth of the length of time of the 2014 conflict, with far fewer lives lost. Uh, this was accomplished in part because of intensive, quiet diplomacy, where we did not make uh, him or leaders in the United States the centerpieces of this effort because we felt that was not, uh, that, that the most important thing we could do was play a role behind the scenes. That's exactly what we did. Uh, the conflict has now ended. There is a ceasefire just over 24 hours after that call was made. Uh, and that was an important uh, point to convey publicly. Uh, but uh, no, that is not our view from here. Um, one other topic. Uh, this month, the Justice Department had informed Washington Post reporters, yeah. and then this week, CNN reporter, uh, that the previous administration had obtained their, their phone records as part of an investigations into presumed leaks that led to news stories. What is this administration's view of the appropriateness of se seeking reporters' phone records, and do you plan to continue those investigations? Well, first, I will say that I learned of this issue for the first time after CNN's report yesterday. And I know similar sentiments have been expressed from many parts of this government. Uh, as I understand it, the records sought and the legal process to obtain them began, as you noted, during the prior administration. Uh, we, of course, this president is committed strongly to the rights of the freedom of press, as you have seen for decades, and to standing up for the rights of journalists. And the Justice Department conveyed yesterday that they intend to meet with reporters to hear their concerns about recent notices. Uh, and they certainly intend to use the Holder model as their model, not the model of the last several years. But really, these decisions would be up to the Justice Department. Well, the Holder model included pretty significantly uh, aggressive leak investigations. The, the specific question, though, is the appropriateness of seizing, seeking and seizing personal phone records from journalists. Do you, does this administration believe that's an appropriate tactic? Well, again, uh, it was done by the prior Department of Justice. I would send you to the Department of Justice for any comment on what their intentions are moving forward. Go ahead. There was a um, mayor's poll that came out earlier weighing um, race relations in the U.S. with 17 percent of people saying that they did not believe um, that things had, uh, well, I'm sorry, 17 percent believing, only 70 percent, things had changed. Mm -hmm. um, earlier, you talked about police reform and what the administration is doing. You mentioned building trust in communities, but what does that actually mean? Well, I think the reason I reference that is because obviously passing, or our view, I should say, is passing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act uh, into law, ensuring that there is more accountability, uh, more requirements and restrictions in place uh, for departments across the country, and also it would be an, a, a, a contribution to rebuilding trust in communities. Obviously, there's more that needs to be done beyond that. That's not the only step, far from it. But uh, I think our view and the president's view is that signing this bill into law would make a contribution. Also, what concerns, um, with concerns among parents about potential long-term effects on children associated um, um, that have gotten the vaccine, what type of, any type of surveillance outside of the two-year plan that's been described by Pfizer has the administration considered um, to help kind of quell the concerns of parents? Um, just so I understand your question, you mean surveillance of the impacts on kids? Mm -hmm. 
Well, first I would say that the most important um, thing we can say, c message we can convey from this administration is it's okay to have questions and concerns. And your primary care physicians and doctors uh, are the absolutely the right people to answer these questions now and a year from now and three years from now. And certainly there has been a great deal. The, the, uh, the, the process of approving vaccines in the United States is the gold standard. We have the highest standards in the world. And uh, our health and medical experts are confident in that. But we also know, I'm a parent, Many of us are parents. Parents have questions about what this means for their kids. And that's OK. That's valid. That's one of the reasons why we are trying to fund and empower local leaders, civic leaders, medical experts, partnering with primary care physicians so that parents feel like they can ask these questions to people they trust, right, who they've been taking their kids to for years. Lastly, the um, Department of Agriculture um, today published the first notices of the funding available. Mm -hmm. um, and so for black farmers who've been talking about they have felt like there's a lot of racism within yeah. that system, we know that the banks have sent a letter to Secretary Vilsack earlier mm -hmm. um, pushing back on those funds being available. And many farmers took it as a threat. What is the administration prepared to do if we start to see that then banks don't um, offer any loans to black farmers because of that decision? Well, I know this is uh, very much on the mind of Secretary Vilsack in terms of ensuring equity and how these funds are being distributed and delivered around the country. Um, I'd probably have to check with the Department of Agriculture and kind of the status of this letter. I haven't been following this as closely. Go ahead in the back. Um, on infrastructure, you mentioned uh, some of the items removed in this yeah. U.S. counteroffer kind of migrating to other uh, proposals, other pending legislation. Yeah. Could some of those then be included in the family's plan? Uh, well, look, I think the reason I referenced the um, the CHIPS uh, proposal and, of course, the Frontiers proposal is because, as you know, those are negotiating and working their way through in a bipartisan fashion at this point in time. But as I've also said from here, but I'll restate, uh, what the president's put forward is a is a bunch of large, bold ideas, right? The mechanisms and the mechanics of how they move forward, we're very open to working with Congress on what that looks like. So uh, there is some overlap in some of the pieces proposed in the jobs plan with some of the components in the CHIPS plan and the Frontiers plan. Hence, there's an opportunity to move those ideas forward. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, obviously, he'll continue to press for these in the months ahead. And the um, original proposal had pretty ambitious plans for electric vehicles. I yeah. think you referenced this a little bit before. But re a lot of GOP skepticism about some of those plans. So in the counter proposal, are you guys ratcheting back on those at all? Or? Yes, absolutely. And again, you'll see the specifics when we put out the um, our entire counter proposal. But certainly, investments in the electric vehicle industry, charging stations, uh, industries of the future, which in our view are going to be the backbone of communities around the country, including communities like Dearborn, where the president was earlier this week, uh, are areas where we feel we need to continue to invest to be competitive with China and boost our workforce. Uh, go ahead in the back. Thanks, Jen. Um, the administration has said that it wants to work with Japan and South Korea to stand up to China's aggression. Um, but as you know, South Korea and China, they're heavily um, dependent on uh, South Korea and Japan's economies are heavily dependent on China. And there's also been some reports about the South Korean side being reluctant to add any language that might um, upset the Chinese in today's joint statement. So how is the administration going to work with South Korea and Japan to, when it comes to standing up to Beijing when their economies are so closely tied to China? Well, first let me say that um, it is, uh, should send a clear message about the importance of these partnerships and alliances that the first two bilateral meetings the President had has had after today are with Japan and South Korea. And obviously there are a range of means we can we coordinate and communicate uh, with both of those countries, um, including through our trilateral um, discussions that we've already participated in at a very high level from the federal government with our national security advisor and our secretary of state. Uh, we certainly recognize that um, fundamentally um, our two countries, uh, the United States and South Korea, may look at 
uh, aspects of our relationship with China similarly and some aspects differently. And that will be a part of our discussion and a part of what we understand going into these uh, discussions that are ongoing now. Uh, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, we feel there's areas of cooperation and partnership with South Korea. As you know, there was a big uh, announcement that was made today, which we welcomed, which is significant investments in the United States by South Korean companies, totaling more than $25 billion, which that reflects the long-standing close economic ties between the United States and South Korea. And we expect there to be continued opportunities for those type of economic uh, engagements and cooperation. Just one more. There's, um, as you know, there's ongoing tension between South Korea and Japan. Uh, will the president, will he urge President Moon Jae-in today to uh, improve its relationship with Japan? Well, first we continue to promote expanded trilateral U.S. Um, South Korea-Japan cooperation. Um, again, you've seen that through the trilateral meetings that we've had at a very high level. Uh, we not only want to strengthen America's relationship with our allies, but also between our allies, and nowhere is that more important than between uh, South Korea and Japan. Uh, so certainly, uh, there's a range of topics they'll discuss, and they'll have a press conference to talk about all of it. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I oh, I'm sorry. I'll go right to you next. I'll go right, I'll, I will not forget you. Sorry, I was jumping around. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. I wanted to ask about President Biden's conversation with Rep. Uh, Rashida Tlaib mm -hmm. on the tarmac in Michigan. What was his reaction to what she said, which was reported to be that um, she told him the U.S. can't continue to give the right wing Netanyahu government billions of dollars to commit crimes against the Palestinians? Well, the president uh, spoke uh, about um, how impressed he was by Congresswoman Tlaib uh, at the event he had um, after he had the conversation with her. So I think he spoke to uh, that already. And certainly he understands that there are a range of viewpoints uh, uh, as it relates to uh, the conflict in the Middle East, which we were in the heat of over the last several days. And he felt it was important to have a discussion with her on the tarmac so he could convey his point of view, certainly hear hers, and uh, you know he'll look forward to continuing to engage engage moving forward. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, following up on Darlene's question about the White House being open, of course now we're all masks off, at least for the press. Yeah. But, um, I, can, I can only speak to our experience here. It seems to be um, on the honor system if we're vaccinated or not. So now the White House is having these events, masks was hugging today and yesterday, and I assume you know, kind of forthright from here. How is the White House tracking vaccinations beyond the folks who got vaccinated, God bless you, on TV like Pelosi at all? So the folks who we haven't seen vaccinated on TV, how is the White House tracking who is vaccinated and who is not vaccinated? Well, again, what the guidance provided was um, information so people could uh, take steps to protect themselves, uh, either to get vaccinated, which every American is eligible who's over the age of 12 at this point in time, or to mask up if they're not yet vaccinated. Uh, so the steps we're taking here, so that means every individual in the White House, members of the press corps, can do exactly that, uh, either get vaccinated or wear a mask. Uh, so uh, the honor system is really about, uh, I don't actually even like that term because I think it's confusing. I'm not saying you're intending to do that. But the real question is, how will people who are not yet vaccinated protect themselves, right? Right? Because people who are vaccinated, what the CDC guidance is saying is that you're protected. So people who are not vaccinated, the guidance is you should wear a mask. Okay, but the White House is not going to go out of its way to necessarily verify this individual or like I've been vaccinated or not, so she's cleared to wear a mask. That's not the, the plan. That's not the role we're going to play. Okay, awesome. Just, just want to sure. clarify. And then uh, a quick follow up on the budget proposal coming out next sure. week. A couple of things that were not included were very progressive ideas like certain drug reform and certain debt relief, and you touched on this a little bit earlier, but yeah. I just want to get a clarification, a message to progressives who might feel a little bit gypped or let down that you know they voted for Biden to get these specific things through in the first 100 days or the first year, and they feel like, well, maybe that's not going to be accomplished for them. So any message directly to those people? Well, first I would say, again, we'll roll out the totality of the budget. You'll have more paper and fact sheets than you know what to do with um, a week from today. And so I don't want to get too far ahead of that. but. What is important for people to remember is that the president talked about his commitment to the lowering the cost of prescription drugs in his joint session address. He remains committed to uh, 
continuing to make uh, uh, health care more affordable and more accessible for Americans. Uh, is the totality of everything he wants to accomplish in his presidency done in the first 100 days? Clearly not, because we've passed that period of time. And will every single thing he wants to get done in his presidency be reflected in the budget? It won't. But that doesn't mean he's not committed to it, and it doesn't mean that he uh, doesn't have a desire to move all of these agenda items forward that he talked about in his joint session address and that he talked about when he was running for president. Go ahead in the back. Good afternoon. Uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's call for a diplomatic boycott of the 2022 uh, Beijing Olympics. Does President Biden agree with that urging? Our position hasn't changed. At all. No. Human rights and all, and as much as this administration uh, <coughs> forcefully defends human rights and We are quite like outspoken that. on human rights, the values of the United States, uh, in our conversations with the Chinese government and leaders uh, and any country where we have concerns, as was clear in the readout uh, that from the President's call with President Xi, and as has been clear in every engagement we've had with the Chinese leaders, uh, but our position on the Beijing Olympics has not changed. Okay, to follow up, uh, back, if I can, the, yeah. uh, in light of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, fighting, uh, genocide against the Uyghurs, the plight of the Rohingya, persecution of Christians across the globe, this is the big question here. Going forward, how is the Biden administration going to uh, foster international religious freedom? Well, there was a lot wrapped up in there. What I will tell you is that, broadly speaking, the President and the administration, the Secretary of State, will continue to advocate for freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of media around the world uh, when they have engagements diplomatically, when we have bilateral meetings through public and private uh, conversations. And closer to home, finally. Uh, We've seen gas prices rising, it's a much different topic here, gas prices rising significantly, and we all know that they hurt poor people, they hit them the hardest, right? Every, every dollar that comes in. That's why it's so perplexing that some are proposing user fees, but it's another okay. topic. Right. Well, you want to continue on your... Uh, Go ahead. Okay. I don't know, uh, you had a question. Well, my question is, is, is the Biden administration considered, does it have any plan or any sort of action it can take to try to bring down prices or at least somehow make the cost less, whether it's a tax or something, to help impoverished people. Otherwise, the money that's going to them in the, in the form of the rescue plan and the other money is really money going back out the door to pay for higher gas, isn't it? Well, first I would say that uh, the President's plans, his proposals, whether it was the American Rescue Plan, his American Jobs Plan, his American Families Plan, have all been uh, proposed through the prism of what he can do to help working people, help people trying to make ends meet, help people trying to put food on the table. His proposals have helped cut childhood poverty in half by this, this year. It's helped bring, uh, put 1.5 million people back to work, uh, has helped uh, ensure that families and parents have a little bit of extra assistance so they can cover the cost of childcare. So that has been the prism through which he's made all of his proposals. I have to wrap this up I, in a minute here. Just but, a quick point of yeah. clarification. What did you mean when you said that this, when it comes to spying on journalists, this DOJ is going to follow the Holder model? Because Eric Holder was the Attorney General when the DOJ was spying on the Associated Press and was obtaining phone records for heroes and individual journalists? Well, the question that was asked, which was a good question, was about the uh, the records that were uh, taken or seized or whatever, however you want to characterize it, um, during the last administration. And we're not going to follow the bar model. Uh, and uh, I would say our, I would point you to our Department of Justice to how they will approach that you, issue. You said the Holder model, and Eric Holder did monitor the phone records of journalists. I think I would point to the Department of Justice here. This, all these decisions would be made by our Attorney General and the Department of Justice. And again, they are going to be meeting with journalists to hear their concerns. Uh, and certainly, we will continue to advocate for freedom of press, freedom of expression uh, in the United States, of course, but also around the world. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. I always, I don't unten unintentionally forget. Um, it's my favorite part of the week. Go ahead. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Jen, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Andrew Pang. I'm with the Yappi, a publication uh, dedicated to tracking Asian American and Pacific Islander activism. I have two questions. Uh, the first one's on anti-Asian hate. Uh, in addition to the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act that the president signed yesterday, the administration also announced plans back in March to reestablish the White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. The White House also said that the president would appoint a permanent director to lead that initiative. Um, do we have any announcements or can we expect an update on an executive order reauthorizing initiative. Sure. Well, thank you. It's very nice to meet you. Thanks for all the reporting you do. Uh, I will first say that um, 
reinstating and expanding the White House initiative on Asian American and Pacific Islanders and ensuring that it is successful as a top priority for the president. He's committed to reestablishing the initiative, as he talked about early on in his presidency. Uh, we hope to have more on that soon. Um, so soon coming weeks on more specifics and an update. As you noted, um, he signed into law a bipartisan bill, the COVID hate crimes bill legislation yesterday. First big event here at the White House with bipartisan support. Welcome people to the White House. Uh, that just conveys how important that legislation was to him. And he also committed to uh, appointing a senior member of his White House team, which he has done, who has a seat at the table, both on policy and personnel uh, to speak uh, to the uh, in the initiatives uh, that are important to the AAPI community. But hopefully we'll have uh, more soon. Maybe if we're having this conversation next week, I'd have more of an mm -hmm. update. But uh, it could be that soon. But it's very nice awesome. to meet you. Thanks for joining us in the briefing room. Thanks for everyone so much. And have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you.